I guess we are not More experience. Why? Has anyone done a that's amazing. I, I guess so. I mean, I'm, I'm used to the stand-up tripod, you know, you know with yeah. someone straining yeah, under yeah, the way of the baby If you haven't already signed in, please sign in. Is there anyone that has to sign in? Oh, heck, yes. I am definitely going to put you Good, how are you? Well, This is awesome. This is like the first event you could have put on. Anything I should be concerned about? I'm so excited. Before I even like, started, like, when I first applied for law school, my, my former me mentor, my, the boss I worked for, she was 20 years ago, she was a member of the court with like, Judge Tiger. And yeah, she's all like, you have to get involved, make sure to like. I'm excited to learn more. Okay. Every lawyer I know is a member of that Well, any lawyer of any substance. I'm going to go to the uniform and say, But he was ordering it anyways? No, he wasn't ordering it. So the guy just decided. Just a random encounter. Take one for the company and then down. Yeah. Well, if you guys had a chance to get a couple of bites in before I introduce you. Go ahead. Hey, everybody. Oh, there's soda just arrived. So if anybody starts dying of thirst halfway through the presentation, feel free to make your way back there. Um, but I'm Anna Breck from the Career Office. I'm really happy to see all you guys here. This should be a really great talk. Um, this is the Inns of Court info session. And I've always known that Inns of Court are a fantastic um, 
networking and professional relationship development opportunity, but I have to say I don't know that much about it, so I'm really excited to learn from all of you about the history and, and everything that it does, the ends do now. Um, with us we have Michael Balistreri and Wes Lowe and your fellow student Ariel Bland, so I'm going to turn it over to them. Thank you. Uh, welcome and thank you for the opportunity to uh, talk about the Inn of Court a little bit. Um, <clears throat> my name is Wesley Lowe. I'm a lawyer here in San Francisco with the law firm of Mannion and Lowe. Uh, four lawyers, uh, one of who is a Hastings grad, my law partner, Jerry Mannion. Uh, we represent uh, individuals and businesses um, in insurance coverage and insurance bad faith matters, representing the policyholder against the insurance company. And then we also have um, also handle uh, plaintiff's personal injury cases. Um, I've been with the Inn for a number of years. I'm the current president, um, and that's sort of my background. Michael? Uh, my name is Michael Balstre. Uh I'm the senior managing counsel of Robert Half, which is the largest professional staffing firm in the world. Um, I do all the international transactions for them. My background before that was international oil and gas in the North Sea. Um, I've been a member of this inn as well as an inn uh, in Wisconsin where I was also briefly stationed and uh, I've also been um, to some of the actual English inn activities so uh, I'll speak to you about that and I've been a member of the inn and on the board for five or six years. Hi, my name is Ariel Bland as introduced. I'm actually a third year here, third year student um, and I just recently became a member uh, this time in October and I can give you the student perspective what would be interesting for you and uh, just if you have any questions feel free to contact me after. Well, I think we'd like to start off today by Michael why don't you give a little history and you've actually sure. been to the Inn of Court in, in England. In London. Sure yeah. all right so um, for those of you who don't know the British system very well uh, the English law system for England and Wales is essentially bifurcated in the way that attorneys practice. Um, the lawyers that you would seek for consultations, drafting of wills, um, contract matters, things of that nature, are solicitors. Uh, they don't really appear in court and they're not independent, I guess I would say. They're completely advocates on your behalf uh, for your agenda. And then there's this second group of attorneys called the barristers, the ones that wear the funny wigs. Um, and they are actually a group of independents like 1099 independent contractors that various firms shop to have a file argued on their client's behalf. Uh, so once you sort of need the hired gun in court, you shop for a barrister. And uh, for those of you who are fans of the Harry Potter series, the English system runs similar to that in that barristers are part of essentially these houses that in the olden days in the medieval times are these guild idea and uh, they were dining halls and residences and offices. Now they're generally residents, I'm sorry, they're generally offices and dining halls only. And the way the, the genesis of the American Inns is, is that before the printing press, uh, the way that, or the Federal Register, the way that the attorneys, the barristers would learn about recent developments in the law was they would meet in their inn over dinner and the judges would read to them the laws that they had made during that period since the last dinner. And so the American inns sort of took that idea of all people within these groups of these inns meeting together over a meal to progress law and develop camaraderie amongst their peers as well as access to some of the higher level people that otherwise they wouldn't have access to. And that brings us to the American Inns of Court, which is essentially a professional organization with thousands of inns around the United States, um, of which ours is the one of the oldest. One of the oldest. <laughs> yeah. um, and go ahead. No, go no. on. Now, uh, just a footnote to that is that uh, my former partner, when we were the law firm, Sangster, Manning, and Lowell, uh, Dick Sangster, was very instrumental in importing the idea of the English Inn of Court to this country. Um, and actually the American of Court is a fairly recent development. It's only been around, I would say, probably less than 20 years. Uh, but one of, the, uh, one of the founding principles, or one of the reasons why the American Inn of Court, uh, or the Inn of Court concept was imported was because uh, sort of in the mid-90s, litigation was sort of, uh, had this bad reputation of being sort of Rambo litigation, 
scorched earth, win at all costs, and uh, both judges and lawyers uh, noticed sort of a decline in sort of professionalism of the, uh, of the legal profession. And so um, lawyers and judges in this country seized upon the idea of the end of court in order to improve and foster professionalism uh, in the legal profession. Yeah, I think that's. And so the way that the in, the way that all the ends are set up basically, is uh, and this is the part you should take notes on for the next time. <laughs> um, the way that all the ends are set up in is essentially they they don't meet. Uh, everyone has busy lives, as you guys all know. They generally across the country they don't meet during the Christmas December, and they generally don't meet during the summer, when the hour, when kids are out of school and that kind of thing. So you end up with an August. August sort of intro, get back together, and then you have a September, October, November, skip December, and then January through eight May, yeah. and then you're off till the next cycle. And the inn is divided into what they call pupillage groups, and each pupillage group has a senior judge or attorney that's been practicing for a significant amount of time with partnership level responsibilities who oversees that pupillage group. And then beneath them there's, you know, 10 to 20 year lawyers, 5 to 10, 1 to 5 law students and clerks beneath that. And each month in a rotating progression, one of these groups is responsible for putting on the program for that month's meeting. And the typical meeting is a program for an hour, which is continuing legal education once you're licensed. Um, it's a dinner and drinks with everyone, and then just sort of a social time. And so um, each, each month you're tasked with a relevant topic, or it's a practice area of one of the people in the group, or a new new topic. They range from everything. Last last month's actually. Yeah, last month's, uh, Ian, we, uh, we did a presentation at the San Francisco Superior Court. The team leader for that particular, for last month, was uh, Judge Richard Ulmer. And he's been on the bench, I would say, maybe five or six years now. And the topic of uh, the program was um, how to get out of jury service, or how, how, <laughs> how uh, people attempt to get out of serving on the jury. And, and so they did a, we did a mock uh, of voir dire, and, and you heard the usual litany of, of excuses, and we kind of explored um, that whole idea. Yeah, it was very, it was kind of a Joseph, Joseph Campbell kind of thing with these archetypes where it was, here's what's available on the web. If you, jur if you Google, like, getting out of jury duty, there's trillions of experts, and this was a way for lawyers to identify these, I read this thing, and this is the excuse I'm using, so you don't use preemptive strikes to get rid of people who are just trying to get out of jury duty. And so it was really interesting, and there were some interesting ones of that, and we have a topic upcoming about media law, uh, social media and lawyering, because as you, as you know from ethics class, everyone hears 3L or LLM or something, uh, when you know from ethics class, it's, you can't advertise in certain ways um, as, a, as an attorney, and also you can potentially post things to your social media of you doing things that may call into question your character or fitness for law. So it's this double-edged sort of how much do you really want to be out there in social media. So things are really relevant and current, and and interesting, and the camaraderie is great. And uh, we go to a different restaurant, or have food catered into the courthouse uh, each month. Yeah. And uh, uh, Michael uh, touched on the sort of collegiality and civility, and that's certainly one of the things that the in of court attempts to foster. In addition to uh, trying to improve and refine uh, legal skills, um, so. Uh, just a little bit more detail about the yes. inn itself. The inn is comprised of maybe 50, 60 um, primarily lawyers, some judges, some law students. Um, there are three main inns in the uh, in the Bay Area. There's the Ed McFetridge uh, Inn of Court, the Lawyers Club, and uh, the USF yes. Inn. Yeah. But um, there are inns all over the Bay Area now, so there's I think a couple inns in the East Bay. There's certainly an inn up in Sonoma County now. Um, and um, one of the major benefits of joining an inn is, uh, A, you sort of stay abreast of uh, very uh, topical issues, legal issues. Um, second thing, you do get um, credit for MCLE. Uh, third thing, obviously, is just sort of the network that you uh, are engaged in and develop. I mean, 
um, um, part of, I guess, being a lawyer is developing your own sort of professional network. And this is a good way to meet people face to face, uh, deal with them both in a professional setting, in the program itself, and then afterwards over uh, drinks and dinner. So just to uh, reiterate a few things that Wes and Michael said, um, as students, uh, I think that we need to be exposed not only to the academic side of uh, the legal world, uh, but also the practical side. And this is what uh, the Lawyers uh, Club of Ends does. Um, and what drew me here was specifically the interest in litigation, if you have an interest in litigation, um, or the more obvious, I think, for students is networking. Um, but for either of those reasons that you would like to join, it's uh, a great uh, sense of atmosphere, camaraderie. Um, there's different attorneys and judges, everything from plaintiff side to defendant side, civil litigation, criminal litigation, whatever your interests are, it's going to be represented there. Um, and there's just the practical knowledge that being in a group with uh, experienced attorneys and judges can bring that you cannot learn um, outside of the class, or you can't learn in the classroom. It's things that you have to be there to experience. And just sitting, even on the first uh, the meeting that I attended, uh, the, the jury selection, there was just so much knowledge that I absorbed there, just from being there and listening to these experienced attorneys debate back and forth about why this person should be here, why this person shouldn't be here or kept here. Um, and I think that as students, that's something that's really invaluable to us and what I would encourage you to sign up for the student scholarship in particular? Yes, um, the, uh, our end of court offers, I think, three to four scholarships. Four this year. Four yeah. scholarships. So if you're interested, uh, 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 apply for the scholarship, and, um, and that basically entitles you to attend the, attend the end of the year. Uh, and the, as Michael said, the end does run basically from September through May. We take a break in December. Every March, there's a joint meeting between the three ends. So that's McFetridge, uh, Lawyers Club, and the USF end. We all get together, and we uh, uh, there's a joint presentation, that, that the responsibility of which rotates among the ends every year. But it's held typically at the Ninth Circuit or the uh, uh, U.S. District Court, uh, the ceremonial courtroom. So there's a presentation by uh, a team in one of the ends, and then there's uh, dinner and drinks afterwards. And uh, again, um, uh, it's, it's a great uh, event. Yeah, and they're, they're all very tongue-in-cheek, and there's a lot of laughing and goofing around in them. The vignettes that generally form the basis of the cases are sort of ripped from the headlines, so to speak, of our own practices. But uh, they're really interesting, and the join-ins is a really interesting one. Um, we've had one in dress up in Revolutionary War <laughs> yes. and debate the Second Amendment. Yes, yes. One correct. of them did cash cab, yeah. and every in sent up its own cab, and they asked questions. We did one one year yeah. where we played music, uh, various song lyrics, and you had to decide what the hearsay exemption was. <laughs> yes. So we had like admissions against interest when Johnny Cash was singing "Shot a Man in Reno." I mean, and there were all these these different things. So it's a really fun way to learn as well, and the sticking power among the camaraderie, the sticking power of the way the messages are delivered, is another really neat aspect that I don't think you always get. It's sort of that Saturday Night Live meets yeah. law school meets you know ask ask the sages kind of a kind of a thing, which is pretty neat. I mean, there is there is definitely a, a, a entertainment aspect to some of to some of the presentations. Some of the presentations are totally serious, and some border on the more uh, comedic side. I guess. Yeah, and, and either way, I mean, ju whether they're comedic or not, they're always sort of extremely content rich. A lot of material, a lot of actual practical knowledge conveyed, and they have to meet certain, obviously, certain expectations of the state bar to qualify for continuing education. We also try to get the ethics. I don't know how many of you know about it, but as an attorney, once you're licensed, you need a certain number of them every year, but there's also a component that they kind of keep changing around, but it's been static for a little bit. You need a substance abuse credit, an ethics one, and an elimination of bias. in the. So you can we incorporate those in, because a lot of times ethics is one of the harder ones um, to get. Sorry, you had a question? Um, Sorry to interrupt. No, that's right. What about the size? How large is your in? Um, how many people are in each pupilage group? 
on the um, our, our end, I think, is about 50, 50 to 60 is what we typically average, and the teams uh, typically are about that divided by eight. Yeah, that divided by eight, <laughs> yeah, roughly. And the okay. biggest inns are, it, it gets cumbersome because of the structure of the inns. So most inns, they recommend stay under like 75. Yeah. There's a few that push it. Yeah. But for the most part, it's if it gets too big, you don't get this dynamic of being able to meet everyone and know their names and that kind of thing. And then okay. the three sort of general levels of membership are, there's what they call the masters, which are the more experienced attorneys. And then the barristers, um, which I think have been out maybe six to eight years, and then uh, beneath Associate. that, associates, which are I think you know one to five years, and then uh, each team every month is comprised of uh, lawyers or law students from each of those groups, so you get sort of a uh, diverse mix. Do the different ends have some form of specialty? There are specialty inns. The three that we're speaking of aren't. The, the specialties we see the most of, like across the country, are matrimonial family law kind of inns. And, and intellectual all, property. And yeah. intellectual property. Those are the two. And there's an intellectual property one I know in, the, in Silicon Valley. It might be based yeah. in San Jose. And then in Milwaukee, where I was based for a while, there was one and all it was was family law in addition to the general inn. So those seem to be the most sort of camaraderie. It's hard to get access to those people a lot of times. I would say that one of, one of, the, uh, one of the nice things about the, this particular, the Lawyers Club in of court, is that it is diversity because we do have um, civil litigators, uh, commercial litigation, transactional lawyers, uh, certainly family law, uh, in-house, uh, valid, federal, federal tax, federal, federal tax uh, sports and entertainment law. Um, so there's there's a there's a nice mix of, of lawyers uh, practices. My question is somewhat similar. Did you say one of the other ends is called the USFN? Yeah. I was U wondering. If USFN. There, <coughs> I was yeah. wondering if there are certain affiliations, like school affiliations, with each in or. Um, the, I think that in you, I think you do have to have gone to USF Law School. Uh, <laughs> it does have an affiliation, obviously, with that law school. Um, and an RN was and still is a, a technically affiliated with the Lawyers Club of San Francisco, which um, used to be a very prominent uh, bar association. I think it's gone down a little bit, but it was sort of like it was created as an alternative to the mainstream bar, which is the Bar Association of San Francisco, which way back when was dominated mainly by uh, lawyers from the big firms and solos and lawyers and small firms decided they needed uh, their own association and started the uh, Lawyers uh, lawyers Club. Yeah, and so we became affiliated with the Lawyers Club. Question? So what is the application process? Did you say that? And is it like selective? Is everyone who apply get in? I think uh, everyone who applies basically gets Yeah, it. I mean, for the most part, as long as we have capacity, uh, the standard student one uh, is, I believe it's a choose your own adventure, right? It's pick any, <laughs> it's pick any, it's pick any three meetings for $150 a year. And if you're a full-fledged member, I believe it's 600 a year to go to all eight. So, um, and then the scholarships that we offer are essentially if you apply and get one of the scholarships, it's that 150 comp. Um, could you guys say more like information about um, applying to scholarships? Um, I mean, essentially what we're looking for in the scholarships is, is the ability to open the door to, um, a term, to, to, to law students who are about to graduate and join the San Francisco or Bay Area legal community and it's sort of the stepping stone to meeting everybody and getting, getting to know us and, and be a part of the inn so that when you make that first foray into actually practicing law next year, you can come on as a full <coughs> member. Because as a, as a law student, the time commitment to come to eight meetings or whatever is, you know, not easy, number one. And number two, it's, it's great to network in those initial roots with everybody. But if you don't really know what you're about to do, you may need to network it with a whole other group of the in. So it's good to sort of spread it around, especially if you're making decisions or looking for employment advice and things like that, that you get sort of an exposure. And the meetings are largely 
posted in advance of topics, or at least the theme, um, that if you do have certain things you're really interested in, like that media one I think is February, mm -hmm. um, you know, you can sort of pick and choose throughout the year. Um, but generally the scholarship is, there's no, we'll have to break a little secret here, we don't actually have an appropriate form, despite the fact that you're all in school here. You can actually send an email and just explain why you know you feel that you know the inn is a good fit for you, and and, and the scholarship obviously um, is is something that you should be in consideration for. And that email should go to Stacy, the executive director. Yeah, you yes. can send it to her, and she can send it to the board. So I think if you all got the email announcement, the flyer, Stacy's email mm -hmm. is on that flyer. But if for some reason you don't have it, you can. Please. Is this primarily for student wise? Is it primarily for three L students who are about to perhaps take the bar and become attorneys, or is it is it okay for a two L to, to start getting involved? I think it's primarily for three three L, but I don't know. You're if speaking to the president. <laughs> <laughs> I would say it's primarily for three okay. Ls. Um, I don't know if we've ever had a two L. Oh. Yeah, and I guess the I guess the caveat to that is is August is. Two L's are three L's, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, you're not that far away, and we continue to exist year to year as well. I'm sorry, you had a question? Um, can you speak about the mentorship program? I, or I think I read that there was some mentor component, or is that just in a large, just the whole thing is mentor? Did I misread? There's no mentorship. I, I, I think uh, right now there is no sort of formal mentorship program, but that's one thing that we are discussing to, um, and, and trying to develop uh, and, and formalize that whole thing. But I mean, you'll you'll certainly meet with uh, plenty of attorneys and and develop contacts and things like that, and hopefully that sort of blossoms into a, you know, a mentorship. Yeah, I would say that there's no one opposed to you saying, "Hey, can I call you once in a while when I have a question?" That's that's basically exactly why the end exists, especially not just for you, but at our level too. Sorry, was there another? We have we exhausted all, <laughs> all the possible burning questions about the end. I'm curious about people's tenure and do people tend to join and then stay? That's that's a very good question. Um, I, I think uh, yeah, if you want to if you want to be a permanent member, that's not a problem. Certainly, the masters are permanent members. Um, other people have sort of rotated uh, in and out. Yeah. Yeah, trial years as well, <laughs> where someone has like a huge trial in San Diego or something, they may leave the inn for a year and they come back. Um, there are some inns that if you're an associate level, you're only allowed to stay for a certain number of years and then they boot you um, to keep the sort of, in all fairness, I don't really know what the justifying reason for it is because the camaraderie that we've built as masters in just the six years that Wes and I have been in the inn since I came to join your inn, essentially. Um, I don't know why I'd throw that away to try and build it somewhere else. It seems <laughs> like a silly idea. Um, you know, some of the people you meet in law school and in the inns are friends, are friends and colleagues forever, so I don't, I don't really understand that. So we're all about life, lifetime uh, achievement. So I had previously heard not about a different inn that it was um, by invitation only from someone who's already in the inn? Is yes. That? Yeah, those happen too, and we're in, we're here to invite you to ours. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, there are some rules we like that. a couple of years or something, then is our invitation still open? Like, can we get a rain check? Or, <laughs> <laughs> you know, just. With the asterisk, I would say yes. Uh, no, I, there are some inns that only work on a referral basis, and then it tends to potentially have the issue of being less diverse. So I think that there are pluses and minuses to those. Um, they get an air of exclusivity in some extents, mm -hmm. but I think that um, a lot of times they, they tend to be friends of friends, and if they're already your friends, then I'm not sure how you network with somebody you already know. So that's kind of always <laughs> been an interesting part of that. I don't know if you want to comment on that aspect. There are, I mean, you can essentially, like a corporation, you can charter your inn. You need uh, approval from the the head mothership in Washington D.C., and then you can create bylaws on standing committees, how our board is comprised, how you get membership, how much your fees are. 
you know, what, anything you pretty much want. So all of those kinds of things, if someone borrowed their country club charter or something and lifted it in, you can get that kind of, those more definite rules. But ours is a little more uh, flexible. Sure. I'm also curious about, like, if you're like a public interest lawyer or a public interest organization, how do you join, so I was looking at the website and looking at the, um, the membership, um, James, how do you join if you're in public interest, or is there like, like waivers or something like that in public interest lawyers? I don't know if we have a, uh, quite frankly, I don't know if there is a uh, waiver reduction in, in terms of in terms of like the membership dues. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I, I don't know uh, if, uh, if we have one for uh, lawyers in pub either a public interest lawyer or a lawyer with a government agency. Yeah. But I mean, I. I, I we would certainly, um, as lawyers, listen to try to accommodate that person. Certainly. Yeah. Do you have government or public interest lawyers in your? We opinion? we have had uh, sure yeah we've had um, lawyers from the um, uh, U.S. Attorney's Office. Mm -hmm. uh, IRS. IRS. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, what about clerks? Are they kind of in the same package as students? Like, if you're a judicial clerk after you graduate, or is they are they associates or? Clerks are like one, uh, like uh, associates. Yeah. They're in the same bucket. The only people that are in the student bucket are truly students. Um, and then it's much more just about your familiar, your experience, time-wise in the law um, as a licensed attorney. Sure. It seems like the your particular firm is kind of a small firm focus, or like since how it was started, but do you feel like there's a mix of plaintiff and defense side, or is it does it lean towards one? Uh, I, I would say it strikes a balance. Uh, I mean, um, uh, let's see, there are at least two firms, lawyers from two different firms in our end that actually handle insurance coverage and insurance bad faith on the opposite side that we handle it. They represent the insurance company. We've actually had cases with uh, against these folks, but you know that's you know that's part of the profession. Um, uh, and then on sort of there's also uh, insurance defense firms, lawyers from insurance defense firms uh, in the end, and we represent plaintiffs in personal injury cases. But uh, I mean the um, I've ended up um, using lawyers from an insurance defense firm in cases in which I represent an insured that's been sued and the insurance company either has reserved rights to deny coverage or refuses to provide coverage, that person needs a defense lawyer. Uh, my first inclination would be to try to get someone from, um, uh, from, from a lawyer that I uh, know and have confidence in. And by the same token, um, lawyers at um, the insurance defense firm sometimes run into problems where the insurance company has made a decision either to reserve rights early or later um, and they need someone to pound the insurance company. They can't do it because they're getting paid by the insurance company so um, I get contact. <laughs> yeah and there is a, I mean a spectrum of practices I mean representing athletes and dead rappers estates for music rights to video games I mean you name it all, all sorts of things. Um, we have some really unique municipal defense where um, like public nuisance and public endangerment where su suits against cities where pavement is up thrust and someone falls and the city's defending. That's Larry, Larry one of our former presidents. Um, and then, you know, I'm sort of the, the sole in-house guy, but um, that's more because uh, of my past that I, that I and the value that I continue to see in the end. Um, beyond the fact that I get to have dinner with four or five of the judges every uh, every month. And we have some specialists who only do DUI cases, for example, uh, for both attorneys and for the general public. And uh, their programs are always pretty interesting, um, especially as an attorney. I think the, the uh, wine drinking the night of that presentation was <laughs> zero when they found out that you could get out of a DUI, but uh, the bar could still take away your license. Um, there's some pretty interesting law, and it's just every week, it's, or every month rather, it's a unique experience of getting someone's perspective and another opportunity to 
to spend time with some pretty amazing people in the Bay Area in your profession. Questions, comments? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks Thank for coming. You. I appreciate Thank it. Thanks for having me. You should have <laughs> make that part of the screen. Has everyone signed in? So you can have your contact oh. Oh, Thank you. Um, I actually kind of a quick follow-up question. Um, when should I apply for next year? Is this sometime over the summer? Or? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Over summer would be great. Nothing I need to worry about for now. I like that. Then that's they just jump in. I appreciate it. Thank you. 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 Thank you.